dialogues. Let me. No, it's not going to be in German. It's going to be in English as well. Um, but there is translation available. Yes, for those of you who um, don't speak English, there will be there are headsets at the um, wardrobe. Hörer, die können Sie da vorne hören und hier oben wird für uns freundlicher was übersetzt. So, um, I call this dialogue with Peggy Pische um, impossible presence on the contemporary colonial unconscious in Germany. And before we will um, commence to do that, I would like to introduce Peggy first formally and then a little bit more informally. So, currently, as you can also see in your um, program, Peggy was born and grew up in East Germany. She's a black German scholar of literature and cultural studies. And after many years of teaching in the Netherlands at the University of Utrecht, and the, United, and the United States at Vassar College and Hamilton College, New York. Um, she worked at the Academy of Advanced African Studies at the University of Bayreuth until 2016, with her research focusing on Zukunftskonzeptionen in Africa and the Diaspora, future concepts in Africa and the Diaspora. Her research and teaching are both located within the fields of an of end at the respective interfaces between black feminist studies and critical race studies, diaspora and translocality, performativity of cultures of memory, which is actually what we will engage profoundly today, spatiality and coloniality of memories, and whiteness studies. She is currently a lecturer um, on feminism at the Gunda Werner Institute of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and she has published on racializations and black images, colonial history and collective memory, as well as Afrofuturism and Afri African diaspora plans for the future. So apart from all of these absolute profound and important and influential um, accomplishments, Peggy is also one of the people that I talked about in, um, in my introductory note today, because Peggy was my teacher when I was a very young person here in Berlin at the Humboldt University, where she had um, a Lehrauftrag, right? It was a Lehrauftrag, um, like a, oh, where she was adjuncting, and uh, she gave a seminar together with Susan Arndt on um, whiteness in literature. And that seminar was so <laughs> profoundly influential for me and for, I think, everyone who participated. Not only because Peggy was the first um, black German woman who was my teacher ever in my life, um, but also because it was so eye-opening to the violences that we um, had, ex that I had and we had experienced while growing up and how that is perpetuated in the contemporary. And so it is um, an absolute, absolute pleasure to um, have Peggy here today to um, um, witness your wisdom, really. <laughs> so I would like to welcome Peggy with a big applause. So I wish we would have more coffee and cake so we could make this like a very German dialogue and have coffee and kuchen in the afternoon. Um, so the idea for this dialogue is actually a little bit less of a dialogue but more of um, me asking Peggy questions <laughs> and Peggy sharing with us because in the preparation for this conversation um, I was reminded of the fact how much knowledge you have and how much um, I enjoy listening to you and I'm pretty sure that everybody else will as well. So the project that I would like to 
start with that you are immersed in um, currently is the project on the year 68 um, and which is commemorating its 50, 50 year anniversary this year and I would love you to um, tell us a little bit about this uh, project like the overall arch so that we can have a, as a starting point. Yeah, Nana, uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation, but also thank you so much for this very warm uh, introduction. Now I feel really, really shy, and I think I will probably, I need some minutes to get into my talk, and I will probably stutter, stutter more than I anticipated. <laughs> um, yeah, and before I go um, and, and, and start to talk about this uh, very recent project, um, um, I want to actually, um, uh, uh, connect with what you said about the um, starting in the ac uh, academic lives because I think that what you remember and what you put so beautifully already puts you know uh, um, an, an, an finger to something um, which is very it, it's it, it, which is very and here is the stutter I told you you know uh, it's very important uh, um, namely that uh, how we shape spaces, literally spaces for us to be, to grow, and to get and uh, to get educated, to educate each other. And that is literally a work of um, intergenerations. And so I also have fond memories of this time um, because I think we both did in this space something which was not meant to be, as Audre Lorde said, you know, we were never meant to be. We were never meant to survive, and we also were never meant to be in a space, in this, you know, highly intellectual space, and to claim it for both, you know, to, um, to claim knowledge, but also to, to actually to have knowledge, you know, because usually um, what we are understood as would be the native informant or kind of an sounding board for um, some exotic experience. So for that matter, I think what we did in the early 2000s um, here in Berlin uh, was quite revolutionary, you know, because uh, from the university system, that was not really meant to be that, you know, there are um, young, um, mostly black women coming in and said, yeah, we might have to say something, you know, we. And um, we always heard, you know, maybe this is not really academic, our topics, our seminars, you know. But we knew, you know, there were others who, others like us who want to know that, you know, who want to get engaged with, with us, you know, and to grow something. So what we actually did at the time is we were undigging um, black epistemology, and that is very important. I just wanted to say that. So. And... Um, yeah, this pro project on um, 1968 is uh, what we call, you know, decolonizing 1968. And the idea started actually with this whole uh, uh, notion of commemoration um, of the, um, yeah, very highly em emancipational time of uh, 68 in Europe and with this idea of um, looking into and celebrating um, democracy as something which f um, built up after 68 an idea of freedom, an idea of um, uh, sexual revolution, um, the idea of uh, um, uh, inclusion, um, uh, the idea of uh, yeah, freedom again, emancipation, um, the idea of uh, um, freedom from religion or freedom of religion. And if that sounds familiar, that should, because these are the, the highlights we are being bombarded right now with the self-description of the West coming and going to the so-called other and trying to, you know, um, push it on them again, you know. And I've, in, in preparation of this year, so already last year, I was thinking about, uh, and, then, and I, I noticed that I got angrier and angrier, and I was just searching um, why, why uh, these uh, uh, tactics and strategies of commemoration, yeah, quite frankly, piss me off. And then I realized um, that um, 
there is so much of emancipation, of freedom fighting, which is already uh, dissolved in, in the 1968 uh, movement of the West, and it is dissolved and not recognized and not, not acknowledged, and it is borrowed by uh, collectives of the others, collectives who were struggling for survival, who were in the uh, uh, anti-colonial struggle, in the civil rights movement in the US, or the Cuban uh, revolution as a recent uh, uh, contemporary um, uh, influence, but also the historical influence of the Haitian revolution, and all of that together is so much into what we now see as 68, which is then being opposed on, on uh, these collectives again. So, and that actually made me very angry when I thought, you know, that we have now a chiffre, we have an, um, an, a code for 68 as something profoundly Western, which it is not. So that's why um, I was thinking and, 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 and trying to develop an, a project which um, uh, go, uh, um, focus on, um, well, we talked about that, Zeitzeuginnen, <laughs> on uh, witnesses uh, from 1968 from the perspective of uh, black and POC young women at the time here in Germany. And um, that sounds pretty easy, um, and it turned out to be a very, very heavy and um, a quite difficult project um, because uh, we all have this archive of knowledge in, in us, and when we think about 68, we all think about, well, in a certain range, about the same. Well, <coughs> interestingly, interestingly, as a person who was not born around that time, but the narrative has worked on me in thus far that I immediately think of the student protests mm -hmm. in Berlin. I think of the student protests in France and Paris. And I think about the um, like martyrdom of Rudi Dutschke. Yeah. So this is what was represented to me as a young person here. Right, ex ex exactly. And um, w you know, depending from which cultural background, you know, uh, l uh, geographical background we are coming from, there might be coming in a little bit more. You know, we we think about uh, a civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But then the void is expanding, and it becomes clear. We, we have not, the first, what, what is not coming to mind would be, you know, um, the uh, uh, anti-apartheid movement, um, Nelson Mandela, Winnie Mandela, of course, um, then the anti-colonial uh, uh, movements in all over Africa, um, of course, also in Latin America. That would not come to mind. Huh? While, for example, there was not a single so-called uh, VG kitchen where not uh, the, the iconic picture of Che Guevara was there, yes. you know, and therefore the Cuban revolution was very highly influential. And yet now we are going back to, you know, symbolically going back to Cuba, um, exporting an idea which we basically built up on these collective efforts, this collective experiences of resistance, of uh, survival struggling, and this is what I want to reshape. So mm -hmm. the idea of the project is to, to have a shift of perspective and to focus on voices which will, were usually never heard in this time. Do you mind? Um, do you mind telling us a little bit about the protagonists, like those um, witnesses or Zeitzeugen that uh, you found in our preparational uh, conversation? Actually, with uh, someone that I sh have to mention, which is Nicola El um, Law El Samarai, um, who cannot be here with us today because they are actually interviewing someone today, recording that person. Um, she shared with us a little bit about like how they find um, these people, these uh, women, and um, and some of the stories that you have um, gathered thus far. Um, yeah, uh, I usually say that actually the all of my work, I sometimes feel like an archaeologist. That actually we never really invent something. We really have to undig knowledge, undig narratives, which are. Um, 
uh, usually, you know, we go to bed and the next day there are, there's dust on it again. And so that's what we do all the time. And I felt that again with this project because of how we are wired and also um, uh, uh, in people f from marginalized and uh, uh, oppressed collectives are in the same in, in the same way educated and wired and conditioned from what is history, mm -hmm. what what is, is is it worth to be narrated, you know, who is a hero and all of that, you know, because of all of that, what we have in mind, it was not really easy to find our older sisters, you know, mm -hmm. to start with to through my own um, archive, so when I was thinking about who do I know, you know, it was uh, then there was somebody next to me, and I thought, oh yeah, of course, I mean, you're 70 years old, you know, I could actually interview you. And then um, the first thing what we heard was, of course, um, oh, I wasn't in 68 there, you know. I, I'm not a 68er, you know, like an 68er, so. And so we need to, we had to talk through that. What what does it mean to be a 68er, you know? And that it is that it is exactly the idea of the project to work through and to unpack these narratives, you know, which then makes us incapable of seeing, of literally seeing uh, stories, histories, and <laughs> and biographies of people who were so profoundly influential. But we yet we do know um, the 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 color of the shoes of of uh, uh, Rudi Dutschke or uh, Joschka Fischer once they took a stone and threw it somewhere, you know, because that is became iconic. So it took us a while to um, really get you know in contact with these women, and now we are interviewing um, uh, um, uh, sisters from. Uh, three different communities, one um, from the black German community, or rather uh, black diasporic uh, community, from the communities of Sinti and Roma in, in Germany, and the Turkish Kurdish community. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, from the Turkish Kurdish uh, uh, community, Seven, uh, her name is Seven. Um, she was uh, really young, 18 at the time, um, and also that, you know, would be the first thing, oh, um, I was so young, I'm, I wasn't an, an, an activist, you know. But what is the definition of an activist? You know, it's not necessarily a white male student, mainly, you know, think about of 68, you know, mainly coming from a very protected and wealthy or at least, um, well, secured, economically secured background was usually having also very safe backgrounds of fathers and influences. So that makes it a little bit easier to, to, to do revolution, you know, to not go to class, but to, you know, push out your, your teacher from, from teaching, you know. Um, but being 18 and being a woman of color, being a black woman in a time where it was so completely normal and so completely entitled to the society to um, have an um, un, un, uh, voiced uh, understanding of an uh, intersectional uh, oppression uh, of uh, racism and sexism, that makes you an activist just by coming of age, you know, with 18, 17, 20 years to try in Germany to get, you know, an, um, an, an identity, a an positive an identity, an, an identity about your own sexuality, um, that was not that easy at, at this time. So um, we talked uh, with these women, you know, about exactly that, that we are interested in, in their stories about um, uh, um, them being that young. Mm -hmm. And also another ta uh, moment in this project, what is very important to me is to unpack um, the idea of the so-called long 68, because especially for, um, for, for communities um, uh, of color, the, uh, uh, the whole notion of migration um, is playing a role as well, and 68 is not just between January 68 and December 68, but it is, you know, it was, it, it, it's a time before and it's a time after that. And Seven, for example, then turned out to uh, be the first um, 
a representative in the um, Berlin uh, Parliament um, for the uh, uh, Alternative Liste, the Alternative List. Um, um, she was a member of the uh, Squatter Movement, Hausbesetzer Movement uh, Bewegung. Yeah, all of that we don't, you know, we usually do not associate with women of color, with black women, you know. Mm -hmm. So that uh, would be seven. Um, then um, we have another uh, uh, sister who is an, um, uh, an Oromo activist, um, uh, Afasa. She uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, she came um, from uh, uh, Oromo land and had to uh, flee the, uh, the country um, and came to Germany in the, in the 60s um, and, uh, yeah, needed to find her way, you know, in, in, in a time where um, asylum was not that uh, normally granted, in a, in a time where actually um, the coloni coloniality and the colonial setting was uh, not just more normalized, but was basically the, the way of life. So um, every, everything what we can criticize, what we can analyze today mm -hmm. was not there as analytic tools at the time. So that is also mm -hmm. not very interesting and um, I'm admiring these uh, elderly sisters, um, how they just did it at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. So that would be um, two of uh, uh, them, and then we have a um, totally cool activist from the Sinti and Roma community um, who uh, was a member of, uh, um, of uh, who was uh, um, one of the founding members of uh, the uh, Sinti and Roma um, Verband in uh, Baden-Württemberg. Mm -hmm. So they uh, uh, founded an. Um, an association, an, uh, yeah, actually even a foundation. They um, mm -hmm. created a foundation um, in the 1960s and 70s um, at a time where also Cynthia and Rama were not recognized as the uh, as uh, uh, victims of the of the Holocaust of the National uh, Socialism. They were fighting for it. They were fighting for this recognition, which basically means fighting for an, an acknowledgement, but also in recognition of what happened to their community. Mm -hmm. So, and she was also a very young woman um, at the time, um, and she's come, uh, is living in Mannheim. So working with these women um, uh, gave me um, a very big um, appreciation also for our collective history, for our uh, communities, and it made me more humble to that, that you know, and an understanding that um, that I can be here, that I can talk about such a project, that I can think about such a project has something to do with them um, living their lives, fighting mm -hmm. and actually being activists. And what we can do, what we should do as the next generations, is um, to do our best that. Um, that their, uh, uh, their contributions are uh, acknowledged and that we get an, uh, you know, a different un understanding of what is an activist, what mm -hmm. is a hero, what is our history. Thank you, Peggy. I actually, when whilst listening to you, um, and also when we talked before, what you work is so often immersed in is like the sort of um, as you said, like an archaeology of or an, an, a mining of um, erased histories, kind of. And talking about those erased histories, you, um, you were just mentioning the Holocaust. And I just realized or remember that one of the narratives that are so deeply connected with 1968 is, um, is that that is the generation that finally in Germany um, was bringing the Holocaust or it started to critique the generation before. And I would be really um, interested if you could talk about that a little bit more, like in the sense how that is like also a little bit of a distorted um, perspective as well as um, like how, you know, how there's like a sort of a linearity, how with each one of these moments, there's another history erased. Because 
from there I want to go with you into the um, colonial, colonial times. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I, I think that uh, we, well, um, the, the, the problem is that we actually uh, always have to do, you know, in working on, on, on two sides. On the, on the one hand, uh, not to negate um, the uh, work of memories uh, which are there, which are unpacked, which are sometimes finally open and out in the air. But then on the other hand, exactly to, you know, work on, not in the sense of yeah, yes, but, but still, you know, what is being forgotten or what is, you know, forcefully forgotten, what is um, being also with that very often pushed aside again, mm -hmm. you know. So um, while we are celebrating, in quote unquote, um, our uh, yeah, German uh, memory uh, model of uh, working through the Holocaust, um, uh, we are still um, not even close to getting a grip of, uh, on uh, colonialism, on um, how um, to not only commemorate, but actually finding the language, finding an idea of how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, we have parallel, um, yeah, parallel narratives going on, um, which are, um, quite frankly, so absurd that um, it is sometimes really not, not to understand why we are not drawing from one experience um, and, and, and learning there and applying it to, to another uh, experience as well. While, um, you know, the negotiations with Namibia, for example, um, which are going on right now, um, which are uh, uh, on a level which is basically actually shameful to the German government, but also um, to the society, because we are still um, t uh, trapped in, an, in, in this uh, incredible t uh, uh, deep empathy gap. Mm -hmm. um, while we are um, commemorating um, the uh, atrocities of the Holocaust, and we should, that is, you know, that I have to add that is already a problem. <laughs> because um, we are only going this one way, you know, and not seeing that um, we need to do more and not just adding on to it, but looking into the complexity that we are, we, our history um, is not, an, not in a linearity, but it is influenced by other atrocities. It is influenced also uh, uh, by, by other experiences abroad. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, um, I remember. I remember when uh, we talked that you were giving an example that you found um, in the Taz, mm -hmm. in the um, Tageszeitung. I mean, this is Tageszeitung. What what is Taz standing yeah, for? Yeah. Tageszeitung, no? <laughs> Daily newspaper. It's a, uh, It's called. Um, mm -hmm. And that was such a like. That, to, that example actually um, symbolized so well the complexity of, the, of, the of, of mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. time period yeah. and what empowerment also <coughs> meant. Right, yeah, empowerment and, and entitlement. Yes. <laughs> and entitlement. And yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, the example was actu uh, actually from um, an experience I had um, at the Tuts, not an art article in the Tuts, but uh, you know that's the left um, a newspaper, daily newspaper, which was uh, basically found uh, um, founded in by the 68ers. and um, a couple of years later, um, then 1968, but it grew out of this movement. So a couple of months ago, um, there was an internal meeting in the Tuts with um, the editorial board and some um, uh, uh, expert from the outside. So they asked me also to come there. And um, the discussion was about how to commemorate both the uh, 1968 and uh, the founding of the Tuts itself. And it turned out that uh, the Tuts is not that young and hip as it is, as they like to uh, uh, like to represent themselves, which they actually noticed themselves during this meeting, um, that actually um, the, um, yeah, the, 
the, the age gap uh, was was <laughs> pretty significant. Um, who were you know the editors in charge and um, some younger people and you know um, just coming into it. Um, but then the older guys were um, kind of being you know f um, taken away by their own nostalgic moments, talking about 68s, get, getting goosebumps about their own lives. You know, I, I have to do put it that drastically. You know, not not all of them. You know, it was also. Uh, um, Hans Christian uh, Ströbel there, and um, you know he is he is really the, the an, an, an old left green activist who was even in the uh, German Parliament, um, stand to his um, activism, and um, was kind of an, very often ousted by his own party, and it felt pretty good to actually be with him together, the rebels in the room, which was pretty simple because of the self-definition of uh, the, the editori editorial board. And this one guy, he talked about you know, how he, um, in, uh, in 68, in one of his classrooms, um, uh, personally pushed aside uh, the professor and you know, kept, kept him from speaking because that's what they did at the time. You, know, you are not talking here because we are taking over. And usually the idea was that um, knowledge production coming, stemming out of fascist tradition from uh, National Socialism should finally be stopped and should finally be erased from, from the uh, post-German uh, curriculum. So far, so good, the professor, but then said, um, well, I uh, experienced this uh, before in 1933 and then this guy with his own goosebumps said, uh, yes, I know, but I'm not a fascist, so that's why this is different. And then he said in the same tone, being totally happy about his own history, that the professor was Adorno. So, and that was actually, you know, I found it um, pretty disgusting mm -hmm. and also shocking, and that is what we talked about in a, in a sense, you know, like, um, that you know, if you get your historical kick out of it, that you could once you know not only touch but push aside Adorno, that makes you something. I guess that works if you are a white German Western man in you know being at the university in '68. Um, but this story summarized everything why I actually started the uh, this other project. You know, and I started it already at the time, but when. When I uh, um, when I experienced that, I thought, okay, this is this is why I do this work, you know, because uh, we can't we can't ha have that as going into a, our you know main narrative, our consensual ma na narrative in society. Mm -hmm. um, because you have touched upon the question, and I mean not just because of Adorno. Um, who, you know, we don't have to push to the side, but I think to critically analyze is always, uh, always much more decent. However, knowledge production is a good keyword, and I would like you to talk a little bit about um, the work that you have done on enlightenment philosophy, because that was around the time you were immersed in that, mm -hmm. deeply immersed with Kant, <laughs> which I still admire you for because it's so hard to read and it can be quite boring, but you were absolutely passionate about it. Um, and you were also passionate to read uh, uh, Hegel at the time. So can you speak a little bit about, I know it's a long time ago, but a little bit about the notion of masculinity and how whiteness is so deeply embedded in Enlightenment philosophy because basically the foundation of what we talk about today as humanity and universality have been basically made, mapped out between those thinkers and the British fraction with uh, Locke and then we have the uh, French girls, the Gobinos <laughs> and the other ones. So do you mind talking mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, um, I, I probably um, studied Kant for about 10 years, and um, that really something that 
kind of really let go of that also after mm -hmm. a while, you know. Um, but what actually fascinated me about it and how I came to studying Kant was um, through uh, actually a, liter um, a, uh, a class in, in literature when I studied literature. Um, and it was a class on um, the uh, 18th century and on works um, uh, of uh, Friedrich Schiller and how race was uh, negotiated in, in um, Friedrich Schiller's work, which was unfortunately not the title of the class, but should have been. Um, because as a very young student, not knowing about that, I stumbled over it, that race does indeed play a role in Friedrich Schiller's work, but you don't get any answers for that. You know? mm -hmm. so, so why is, you know, in the very first um, uh, uh, literary text on, uh, uh, which is a crime story and basically um, um, built the foundation of uh, cr crime literature in, in the German canon. Um, why is it that the uh, main perpetrator um, is completely racialized? So it is not possible not to see that. I taught, later taught this course, uh, uh, a course I developed, but this text, um, uh, also in the US, and um, especially my students of color uh, immediately picked up on that, that, you know, they immediately saw that, you know, and uh, I could only do that be because also, of course, I can handle it, and um, I am an, a, a, a black lecturer because I had literary students in my class who came back reading that and saying, you know, I felt totally offended reading this text. So. How is it possible for 250 years that not so many people felt offended reading the text? And these students had the experience I had when I re first read this. And then the only theoretical literature on Friedrich Schiller is what you then get, of course, about aesthetics um, and his studies on history and um, the, the notion of the Deutsche Trauerspiel, et cetera. Et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then you, see, you come very closely of, you know, to his own work um, and uh, reception of uh, Immanuel Kant. So I had to go there. I had mm -hmm. to literally go to Immanuel Kant and then um, learn about all of that, which is um, mainly not been um, taught uh, uh, in philosophy classes or in other classes. Um, that uh, uh, Immanuel Kant brought the notion of race into the German context and really literally bring it into the German language and was then operated in um, different of his projects of uh, the philosophy of history but also in the anthropology uh, project. Um, um, he deeply immersed the um, notion of race into the idea of Germanness and that is very, very deeply also um, intertwined in the literature at the time in the mm -hmm. 18th century to begin with, and then of course, um, you know, took his own narrative pa path and uh, uh, reception um, in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And then when we read that together with um, this German situation of the 18th century, we come to your question of uh, masculinity and whiteness um, that uh, basically from what I would say maybe um, uh, a, little, uh, a, little, a little bit with irony that, um, well, the, the German intellectual soul was uh, uh, pretty much in a, had uh, an, an own complex of um, not being fully accepted in the European imperial uh, uh, um, split it up in uh, different little uh, um, kingdoms and, uh, mm -hmm. and countons. Um, and uh, so the idea of a German national character, which is a definition by Kant, um, was built through philosophy and literature in the 18th century. So you find um, a lot of these longing of being something in the world mm -hmm. um, by white men who were not part at the table, who did not get 
a seat at the table, you find that immersed in our literature, in our phil philosophical thoughts. Mm -hmm. And we then see 150 years later in, um, in 1884, um, when it came to the uh, Berlin Conference that literally that is what Germany was longing for for so long time, mm -hmm. a place on the table, literally a table mm -hmm. where then the uh, continent of Africa was uh, also again literally, I, saw, I, I know I say that very often, but it is really when we talk about these kinds of history which, which are um, in a, a, a kind of, of layered, um, we have to uh, emphasize that that really happened, you know, mm -hmm. where um, the continent was cut up uh, in pieces that Germany also could get uh, some, some uh, colonies. So that was the topping point, but it was prepared 150 years earlier, mm -hmm. the idea of having, becoming an um, imperial po uh, power having uh, a process processing of colonies um, and also processing of this um, definition of a ruler and of course in that matter also uh, of whiteness, which was defined by German philosophers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You see why I loved her classes? It's like you could just sit there and listen. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, let me just uh, gather myself. Sometimes when I'm making these jo jokes, I'm uh, losing my own um, strand of thought, just uh, unhinge myself. Um, yes, yeah, so I, what I wanted to say is that it is then also not really surprising that this kind of cultural good, when you were at the university here or um, elsewhere, um, or actually he more here is also your work can be very threatening because it's really deconstructing something that has been now over centuries um, well taken care of. It's like the foundation of this country and would actually, it's, it's, a, it's a scary um, proposition. Um, I uh, wanted, <laughs> I think this is the theater <laughs> workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is not outside. Did autumn is no, no. Autumn is definitely um, um, engaging her participants. Cool. Um, we should also <laughs> do something physically. Yeah? <laughs> um, let me return, or in in connection to this, um, because we are both black German. I also want to talk about being black German, and I would like to um, engage with black German history. So amongst your deep investment in, uh, with German philosophy, uh, you are also, and I have to point that out, because um, Peggy, ha Peggy has been for how many years now part, uh, been part of ADEFRA? Um, how many years is uh, that? 28. 28 years, so this is ADEFRA. Um, <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> a lot, but I mean, an, an integral part of ADEFRA, um, but also um, part of the ESD, so the Initiative um, Schwarzer Menschen in Deutschland. Um, and, um, and so when we talked, and you know, now you were talking about literature, and you are actually um, coming from literature, mm -hmm. comparative literature studies. I remember that you um, mentioned the notion of uh, violent language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you can talk about that a little bit also mm -hmm. from a historical perspective, yeah. because in a way, Schiller is violent yes. uh, in his oh, semantics. Yes. So. Right, exactly. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So now I'm thinking about, you know, maybe I should come up with some, some exercises to, <laughs> that we can counter that, you know. <laughs> let me think about it. If, if somebody has an idea, let me know. You know? <laughs> um, actually, I would have an idea. We could, we, we, we could do that in a second, if, if you like, if it would not. <laughs> let's let's, let's see. Um, because about language and violence and language, um, yeah, I'm a member of ADEFRA um, since 1990 when, um, and I would have been earlier if I could have, but there was this thing <laughs> there. 
<laughs> the wall. Um, and um, it really changed my life, once again, literally <laughs> changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, because this is where I would say um, I found my home um, to grow and to rest um, my soul in a positive understanding and, and capability of living of blackness, in a positive blackness. Um, and also in the uh, possible, or giving me the possibility for, the la for a language, for, for who I am. And I always said, you know, that was my second coming out. And that was not, um, and it was the harder one. Basically, my, 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 my queer coming out was not that hard. It was just that I noticed that once again, in, in the GDR, we did not have an active language. We did, of course, we, have, we knew the words, but if you, if you don't use language in an active way, you do not have spaces. You do not have physically spaces to experience who you are, and that is what I found after, after I left uh, East Germany in 1990 to study in Tübingen. Um, so, and I kind of stumbled into the uh, feminist queer women's movement <laughs> and I felt like, oh, okay, yeah. And I knew, okay, it was just the language which actually kind of um, uh, was missing. But when it came to my black coming out, that was much more difficult because it also touched upon much deeper um, in my own family. It touched upon everybody, you know, in your in your in your life. Uh, that does, of course, also with you know, if you come out not straight, of course. Um, but it was something different because people also noticed that they did not have a language mm -hmm. that they actually, you know, for their own loved ones, did not have a positive language. And that is what I, what I um, experienced in 1990, that um, there was a, a black German community um, starting in the 80s, which we now already also know that it is kind of, we call ourselves as the second community, because there were communities before us too, in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, but in the 1980s, um, uh, there were a, a, a couple of historical events which then, you know, took up a momentum. And as Katharina Okentoye once put it away, that it, it started out like a train. And then after a while, this train got, you know, took up spe uh, a speed and um, uh, other uh, um, cars would be added to it, you know and you couldn't stop it. And mm -hmm. so I found myself lucky that in that 1990, I found an, um, a, a poster, an advertisement for an, uh, a gathering for the first Bundestreffen of, of, of Adefra um, in Munich in 1990. And I found it in the um, women's uh, uh, um, bookstore, <laughs> so a tiny little space. So it, it matters that I had my queer coming out before. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I got there, and mm -hmm. this is uh, how I found my community. And um, speaking of uh, uh, language and a lack of language and the violence of language, I think that is um, especially, uh, uh, you know, on what uh, this early community uh, did in the 1980s and also a little bit more than in the 1990s when we also could come together um, to to build, to, to, to start to recognize each other, to find a language for ourselves and for each other, mm -hmm. and to build something which was also not meant to be a community. Um, it was not that we knew, okay, that's not what we had, so we have to, we have to uh, uh, create it, but by really coming out of an a deeply desire and to an understanding of a lack and a void in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And central to this um, was uh, uh, an, a piece of literature, a book, um, when a volume of um, biographies of uh, stories and of life experiences of black women in Germany, which came out in, uh, 90, uh, 60, uh, in, in 1986, <laughs> 1986, not uh, the other way around. 
and um, which was published by two very young uh, black women at the time, um, uh, Katharina Okontoye and uh, Mai uh, Opils and then Aim. And um, they uh, titled the book um, Afro-German Women um, Speaking Out and um, Afro-Deutsche Frauen auf den Spuren ihrer Geschichte. Genau. Uh, Farbe, Farbe bekennen. bekennen and, and then mm -hmm. the title um, uh, Showing Our sh Colors. Showing our colors. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it was for the first time this terminology of Afro-German. And 86 is basically the day before yesterday. Um, we should not have an emotional connection to 1986 as we have to the 15th century or the 18th century. We probably all know people from 1986 who were then in their full grown lives, you know. What that means is, um, and even if you're not, <laughs> you can look around and you find people who were around at 1986. And what that means is, you know, if we can then try to emotionally attach to that, you know, that until this time there was not a single positive word for black children, black people in the German language. It was basically um, contributed and offered to by this volume. That means that um, the children who grew up mainly in their white families also did not have the opportunity of being you know, spoken to, being addressed as in a, in, a, in a positive way. That is violence. That is why violence what you experience, but it also means that a whole society had the violence of language. Every time when we don't have an opportunity of something positive, describing something positive, or every time when we um, decide to go for the old uh, 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 racist and uh, uh, discriminatory t uh, term, is when we once again act in violence, but also uh, going, attaching back to our well, the trauma of violence, what it does in your own body. Language comes out of our bodies. It is inscribed into us, and we all have these codes. We have these words. We have these symbols, you know. Mm -hmm. We just had this very strangely uh, um, uh, uh, reported and um, in, in media uh, uh, narratives already uh, packed in um, a wedding in the Buckingham Palace, uh, when you think about it. You know, I, d I, d I don't want to talk about that in, in length, but just to, to ex mm -hmm. just, just to make oh. the side ref reference, you know, oh, in, in, in Germany, what, what I mean when, when I talk about this violence in language, you know, the, um, in, in, in the German television, it was being, um, uh, reported in the ZDF, which is um, um, an, an, yeah, it's national television. Huh? Yeah. It's not it's not some some private uh, channel with a lot of money, and then um, they can do whatever they do. They have actually they, they do have a certain um, uh, well, th they do have a certain way of um, transporting news and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, yeah, educational uh, uh, goal and uh, guidelines. Um, it was totally racist. The way they uh, uh, talked about this wedding, how they uh, uh, reported on this live um, airing of this wedding, and um, the very uh, actually shameful and also hurtful part of it is, it was not you know this plainly fascist or racist terminology and language. No, it was the lack and the void of, of knowledge behind that to tapping back into this old archive of colonial mm -hmm. racist language, what mm -hmm. we have, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and now we are basically 40 years later mm -hmm. um, and we still have not fully 
lift into the opportunity to use positive language. So it really matters. We see that, you know, with yeah. this reference, we see how much it matters and what it means, what these women did in 1986. And especially for black uh, young people, um, girls, but also boys, but from, you know, from all genders in between and beyond, it was very important to have um, an, an, an offer and possibility for positive language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, um, it's, it's amazing that you... Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, I, I don't even want to open it up. I just want to add to that, that the, um, you know, now the Duchess of Sussex has their, what is the Wappen again, like the family emblem, they create one for each royal, and there is a specific blue that is in the background, um, and it um, represents the ocean, because she is from the US, but it's really, it's, it's actually, and there's no mentioning of the Middle Passage, nothing, but it is the ocean. In, and I thought, okay, the British also still have a lot of work to do. A way to go. Oh, a yeah. way to go, ways to go. Um, with that said, now we have been talking for almost an hour. Um, so I'm coming to my last question, and then I would like to open up so that you can also, um, I'm, uh, that you can also ask Peggy questions. I was very selfish by doing this for an hour. Um, but my last question is actually um, connected to futurities and to um, where the, what, uh, and to temporalities, which is also a project that you have been uh, doing in Bayreuth. And so I would love you to talk about that a little bit because um, I think it's, profound and important for the audience to hear. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I think all of my work, um, sometimes, you know, uh, people ask me, wow, you're doing all of these different things, but for me, it's actually, it, it, it all comes together, and it, mm -hmm. they, they are crossing each other anyway, but they are all stemming out of, I think, um, a, a personal motivation or a personal search, and um, so one part was for me to find, yeah, to, to find my own identity um, by being, an, uh, being able to uh, embed myself into a community and growing in, in that community. That is where I came of age. And the other took a little bit longer, that um, the search for the, I always had this, this thriving question of, how was it possible that um, our th th that our collective that we are able to survive these atrocities um, um, and and Holocaust? How is it possible? And um, how uh, how did we do that? And of course, we have history books, and um, I, I learned a lot about history. But there was always more behind that. And, um, and then I found that actually with uh, this project on, on future conceptualizations, um, mm -hmm. because uh, that's when it hit at me, and I thought, yeah, you know, and to, to collectively survive atrocities is only possible through, by, by a very clear and deeply and intergenerational imagination of future. Otherwise, it is not possible, I think. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to understand more about this idea of future and also what imagination means. And imagination not just as thinking of something, but um, as a methodological tool, because I think that is exactly what um, uh, communities of color, uh, communities with uh, um, experience of uh, oppression uh, uses, you know. and. So I digged more into that, um, uh, looking into uh, narratives of uh, collective memories, um, which basically is future imagination, you know, collective memories. And that's where, for example, in the middle of this project, I started to reread um, uh, Toni Morrison, Beloved, again, and 
I read it in a different way because it is, of course, I mean, uh, talked about and um, many, many books and articles are written about it. And it is, uh, it is one, one of the most important deep, 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 deep books. Read it again. You know, I, lo I love it. Um, but I started to read it as um, a book on collective future imaginations. And that just, you know, um, uh, uh, opened uh, my eyes uh, for even more of these uh, um, um, aspects into future imaginations, you know. Um, and then, um, you know, in with, with different works, I, um, uh, different aspects, uh, um, one of the uh, symposiums where I thought, you know, okay, this is connected to that again. <laughs> Um, was in London, you know, at the Africa Rights uh, uh, mm -hmm. Festival um, a couple of years ago. There, um, I was uh, invited uh, by Evangui Vagoro, mm -hmm. and uh, she put together a panel on um, on love and what's love got to do with it. And I thought, what I got to do with it um, because my work, I don't know if that fits into it, and it did. It did indeed. Um, and that's where I, uh, um, yeah, thought you know p could bring things together, and certainly also with the work of Tony Morrison, but of course also others, um, that future is actually like love. Mm -hmm. It is you know like love. You you need somebody else for it to fully be able to um, uh, uh, to experience it and to comprehend it also to. Mm -hmm. So future is like love. You you have to can only comprehend it with somebody else, and only when you share it you get more. And it is not like we always think about it. If uh, somebody else has something, you you have less of it. It is actually the opposite, and that is one of the thriving points I think in. Um, uh, what we also see in a collective memory of uh, and in collective memories of uh, oppressed people of uh, uh, collectives experiences of uh, atrocities that uh, this love and this imagination of future is what makes survival happen mm -hmm. that's you know what what uh, um, Audre Lord uh, I think also meant with that mm -hmm. um, with her poem of survival. Mm -hmm. I think I think what is missing or not missing, but what we did not mm -hmm. touch upon because we didn't have enough time, but that what should be mentioned is that Farbe Beken in eighty six actually came into being also because of the influence of Audre Lord, who due to her physical um, medical condition spent a lot of time in Berlin in the nineteen eighties. Um, so I think that is very important also to, you know, like how are we situating or how are we framing that collective memory? It's like one of consistent exchange and consistently imagining our future. Thank you so, so much, Peggy. Thank you. Um, do you want to do your exercise or do you want to ask questions? Um, yeah, how are you feeling? Are you up for an exercise? Yeah? Okay, well, uh, no, it's not an, well, uh, it's an experiment. Um, I like us all to get up and go around, just a second, go around in the, in the room. And as you see now for more than an hour, you know, when, when I talk, I do a lot with the hands, you know, and we are usually we are fixed on our language. If we use uh, uh, spoken language, then we are fixed on that. So I like for us to not using spoken language, but just your body. You know, only experience your body and walk around for a while, and try to engage with everybody. Not you don't have to with everybody. You know, not that you are counting. Who I didn't? Oh, I didn't see you yet. Um, but just to make contact in a different way and try not to use too much of your hands because that's the next thing. If we can't talk, we do that, you know. And see what happens, what happens with your, with your own body, with your body language, 
but also what is the other body language and how you respond and feel responded at to, you know, by other people and how that maybe change and shifts. And, I, you know, if, you, if you're up to that, you know, I would... For how long are we going to do that? We can do that for 10 minutes or something, you know, because we need to groove ourselves into, you know. If you feel like you're done, just sit down, you know, and we will see. You know, if you feel like I have enough now, it's fine. And then we come back and we see, you know, what happened, how you, how you feel. Oh. Okay. And we all do it. Yeah, well, thank you so much for engaging in this little weird exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not so much. <laughs> yeah? Okay. But the great thing about that is that I don't have to talk about now, so, but actually you. So please, would you like to share what happened, how you experienced that, what you observed, noticed? Carmen. You said it was torture. Do you mind? Um, yeah. 
an alle, die kein Englisch verstehen. Uh, maybe I'm the only one who experienced that, but that's okay anyway. I felt an enormous tension in the room, and I think a lot of frictions which are present in this audience were suddenly more uh, tangible, and uh, it was really hard to do it. That's what I experienced. Other experiences? Yeah, you can also speak in uh, in German. You can auch auf Deutsch sprechen, wenn ihr wollt. Wie eure Erfahrung war? Liebevoll. Sie brauchen nichts. Also es waren sehr viele positive Blicke und sehr liebevolle Blicke, die man getauscht hat, ne, mm -hmm. in dem Moment. So there were a lot of um, very um, uh, positive gazes and uh, eye exchanges and very uh, loving. And that is true. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that is true, too. <laughs> yes, please. Da hinten? Just hold for a second. I guess especially in a city like Berlin, where strangers usually don't give each other nice looks, it's quite nice when you just walk around and you see strangers. You've never seen them before and you just smile at each other and that's kind of also weird, but very nice as well. So I enjoyed that. I have a sense where you're going with this. <laughs> um, some, some other experiences? So did you feel like the whole time the same? with everybody, that would be weird, <laughs> there is a right? Thank you. Um, it's a bit difficult for me to, to describe in language um, because these, there have been moments that I felt I was intimidating another person by being very confident, like wanting contact, and then I felt the other person was kind of afraid. So I immediately took myself back again, and then I felt this kind of, you know, slippery slope. How, what is my body saying? How does another person read my body? And of course, there also have been moments of really confidence, which have, you know, like also happened just like that. So it was all, you know, all the way through everything which could happen in between, a meet, like in this kind of short dialogues which was very interesting, yeah. Thank you very much for being that open, yeah, yeah. Um, just because the mic's here, um, thank you for the exercise. I felt, um, as someone who probably doesn't know a lot of people in this room or at this conference, that I had permission to be acknowledged and to acknowledge other people. And of course, it's not easy because you didn't give us a structure and there wasn't a set of rules that we're supposed to do, but it makes, I made me realize how much we're used to having these rules of what social engagement are. And it, I guess in this context, it made me think about the gaze and what does it mean to look at someone. And already today, I noticed just coming into this building, and thank you, and I don't know who you are, but for organizing this beautiful conference, um, that people were looking already positively to each other. And I, I felt like I'd already met a lot of souls, but. I felt with your intervention, Peggy, that that was enhanced. And I don't know, it was very beautiful for me, even if it didn't feel smooth, that that possibility was created. Anything else somebody wants to share? Nana, you wanted to share something. <laughs> yes, I wanted to share something. Um, Actually, it's this strange, sort of, not strange, but um, doing the exercise, of course, like seeing different, many familiar faces, also having a, a specific role, it made it very easy, because I felt like there was already like a certain type of empowerment, mm. right? So, duh. However, um, it reminded me of 
being in Berlin and a very specific phenomenon, particularly for me in Berlin and coming, outing myself as black, coming into my blackness, um, that all of a sudden I saw other black people differently in the street and the sort of um, embodied nonverbal um, acknowledgement of each other happens, happens and happened to me, for me, all the time on the street. So you pass another black person, and not everybody does that, um, but you would see each other, I see you, you recognize each other, and to me it always meant I got your back. And interestingly, in, um, whilst I was living in Ghana in 2002 or th three, um, when you would walk into a new area, you would actually do the same thing, because you ha first of all, you have to acknowledge the person and the per that person's space, and then in the second step, they also knew you were there, and so if anything happens to you, there's like a certain kind of responsibility and accountability that, you know, that is created, and I kind of felt that, or feel that here in the public space, and it's silent. Mm -hmm. It's not nothing that, um, you know, it's just there. Wow, yeah, yeah. Wow, that is actually, that, that's pretty cool because it's, you know, what, what you bring out, you know, what, what you just said, that is how to create an, a contact, an interaction, a space to, to look after each other, to mm -hmm. also care for each other, you know, to signal maybe I'm, you know, if, maybe if something happened, you know, I'm mm -hmm. there. It all starts with, you know, you need to make sure and that you are being seen. You know mm -hmm. that, and this is all what is a you know what is the collective black experience you know mm -hmm. coming into existence, coming into you know the physical space to be seen, and certainly in the spaces where we are so few, it is you know exactly what how you describe it. You know, not everybody does it. That also does something to people. You know, I mean, at mm -hmm. least to me. <laughs> But it matters, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, an, to recognize another black person to you know, not and go, go your ways, you know, even, you know, if I'm late for work or something, but you always have time for that, mm -hmm. you know. And what you all said, you know, is, is actually, I think what this exercise can bring to light if you are willing to engage with it, you know, our different personalities, because this we is not we in this room and it's never somewhere in the space, you know. And it also, it is usually, as we know, and then analytically talk about, but it's only for some of us to really physically and emotionally to experience it usually. You know? What it means to be in a space where you, everything is projected onto you and there's whole, whole books and volumes of narratives projected onto your body already. And there is no engagement about, you know, what you described, the, was there an invitation? You know, how is my body being read? Did I give signals which, or are, is that different? Because I was like that, but that might be like that, you know? And it should be okay, but the, when do we think about exactly, you know, oh, I'm in that as, as well. Because usually the invitation, what we get every day, is if you are marked as white, which is the unmarked marker, then you don't, it's your space. You don't have to think about that, you know. Was it an invitation or not, you know. Mm. And if you do it personally or not, that is not the point right now. It's what, the, what this public space is usually for us. We all share it physically, but we share it in a different way. And some of us are not even seen in the public space. That's why this is one of the collective strategies what we have, which are, you know, diasporically, transnationally, you know, it works everywhere. It is also very important everywhere, you know. 
everywhere, everywhere? No, oh. if, I, if I would do that in New York, people would get offended with me. Like if I would <laughs> greet every black person in New York, they'd be like, what does she want from me? Yeah, that, 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 that is true. You know, my tiny little East German heart, when I first went to the US, and, and, and now I finally also get to say that, you know, it's, it's not just ki kind of, um, f uh, 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 yeah, I don't even have the word. But you know, my, my English, I refer to my English as a street language because I never really learned English in, in an academic setting. So I had my education in East Germany. And then I came in 94 for the first time to the US and uh, on the streets in, in California. And I was like, yes, hey, hello, hello. <laughs> and I know exactly <laughs> what you mean, you know. And yet, there, there were others, you know. I mean, of course, yes. you know, the black community was like, What's wrong with this child, you know? <laughs> of course. But then on the other hand, people would talk to me, which would never happen here, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, yes. I like your classes. And, you know, uh, uh, where did you get that from, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wore different classes 20, 30 years ago, of course. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed, you know, in, in my mind, like, why are you talking to me? For a first second, you know. Mm. So of course there were different ways of approaching each other, but usually in in the diaspora like that settings, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is it really matters something, you know, like to acknowledge. You know. But also what you what you said, um, uh, like that it is a space where it's an empowerment space, or you said it in a different in a different words. Um, also, what I want us to not only keep in mind, but maybe also, you know, connect with what we just physically experienced. People need to work for making it an empowerment space. So an inclusive space of having, you know, that for some, maybe having, you know, the, uh, that your soul can rest a little bit and you can have an easier smile, more open eyes, you know, and mm -hmm. not having your guards up to here but maybe deciding it, having it here today, or maybe even like that, you know, that it means for, because of you and you and you are here, you know. So, and that, what that means, you know, that is what I like us also to feel a little bit more. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, I think this is a fantastic um, ending to this uh, dialogue, unless we have like super urgent, urgent questions, but um, Peggy is still going to be here, um, so there's also the possibility to mingle, to talk to each other, and to share. Um, it is now four, almost 4.40. You have like a longer gap, a longer time stretch now um, before we will come back into this space at... 6.15, let me see, I, know, I don't know my own program by heart. I should know it by now. 6.15, um, yes, if we, start, um, if we start on time, but 6.15 is the original time. So we will be back here for Okwi Okpo Kwasili's performative lecture that I'm very much looking forward to.